To the teachers, assistants, and support staff who see potential in every child, Grand Canyon University recognizes you. We created the National Center for Teacher Preparation at GCU, along with a generous scholarship, so you can become a licensed teacher with paid benefits. Over 100 GCU alumni have been recognized award recipients, including Superintendent, Administrator, and Teacher of the Year. Find your purpose at Grand Canyon University. Private, Christian, affordable. Visit gcu.edu slash parapro. We're excited to announce that our very own podcasting platform, Zencaster, has become a new sponsor to the show. Check out the podcast discount link in our show notes and stay tuned for why we love using Zen for the podcast. You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Archaeotech Podcast, episode 170. I'm your host, Chris Webster, with my co-host, Paul Zimmerman. Today, we discuss some of the tools we use with a focus on mobile GIS and surveying strategies. Let's get to it. All right. Welcome to the podcast, everybody. Paul, how's it going? It's going pretty good. Right now, we're recording on December 30th. So it's in that kind of liminal period between Christmas, uh, for those who celebrate like I do, and you know, celebrate like I do is give my family some gifts and then you know drink some eggnog. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and, uh, exactly. and New Year's, right? Um, where nobody really knows what's going on. It's hard to make appointments. So you work on other things. I've been working on a lot of other things because mm-hmm. I can do that without having to uh, rely on other people. Well, how, how's your uh, end of 2021 going? I'll tell you, this is the best week. And it's actually, you know, a lot of people like to have Christmas or New Year's or something like on a weekday. So you get like more days off. But I'll tell you what, I like having the book ended weekend personally, because Mm -hmm. most of the people I would have to work with are off this week anyway. So even if you don't take the week off, there's just like not that much to do. And it's a it's like a built in chill week for the entire year. And it's just I don't know. It's nice. And I'm transitioning at my workplace a little bit. So, you know, don't have a lot to do with that this week. Uh, That'll kick off in the next few weeks. It'll it'll change a bit. But yeah, it's been nice. So we're here in Charlotte, North Carolina still. And Mm -hmm. shortly after the new year, day or two after we are headed back to the West Coast. So it should be interesting. But yeah, hey, uh, you're heading back to Reno. Well, no, we're heading to Arizona for an event we're oh, going to, to in Arizona. January. That's right. Okay. I was going to say, because yeah. uh, Reno got hit by that snowstorm, didn't it? Yeah. We're kind of staying away from the north in our RV, anywhere in the north. Like when we get, when we head back, we're heading back as far south as we can, probably taking 10 across. We're going to try mm-hmm. 40 for a little bit, but 40 is getting into some stuff possibly. So we don't mess with snow tires and chains and stuff like that in a 26,000 pound house. Yeah. That was one heck of a storm. Yeah. No, I was, I was a little worried when you said you're going back west. Yeah. Like, oh, oh, how, how yeah. is that thing off road? <laughs> Whew, I don't even want to know. So yeah, no. Anyway. All right. Well, today, this is a topic, Paul, that you came up with and mm-hmm. uh, and basically set us up for us. So I'll let you get on with what we're going to talk about here. All right. And before we even talk about the topic that I queued up, I've got already two asides. One I was thinking about <laughs> <laughs> what I was talking about last episode about R and how it doesn't really work for me. And for a long, long time, I've said, oh, it's not really the way my brain works. Not just R, but that's that's my my metric, not really mm-hmm. a metric, but my 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 guiding principle for whether I like a particular software or not. It's like it works with the way my brain works or it doesn't work the way my brain works. And I've I've always you know, I've used that for probably a couple of decades now, and it's always felt a little lacking, uh, and I didn't yeah. have a good analogy. And the other day, I, I actually I I realized a much better analogy for it. It's uh, it's like this: I'm extremely right-handed. Mm-hmm. I write with my right hand. I draw with my right hand. I gesture with my right hand. My left hand is practically useless. Like anybody who's <laughs> ever heard me play guitar can can attest. Nice. Give me a pair of right-handed scissors. I'm fine. Give me a pair of left-handed scissors. And the options are try to use it with my right hand and it won't work or try to use it with my left hand and it's it works, yeah. but not well. Right. Yeah. And so that's how I feel with a lot of different kinds of software. You know, some of the stuff just naturally fits with me and some of it I have to work against my own instincts in order to make it work. And that's when I kind of throw up my hands and say, no, I don't want to do this. Well, that is a good analogy because that's how a lot of things go in life, right? Sometimes some things you just get and that's generally what people gravitate to and other things, it's a real, real struggle just to understand, you know, what's going on. Honestly, I feel like, uh, well, and then sometimes the light bulb goes off, right? Like sometimes Mm. 
I look at Trello that way. We use Trello to organize our shows and stuff. And I was first introduced to Trello by uh, a colleague I was working with and, and he was a coder and he was really into Trello and I just couldn't get into it for like a year. I almost resisted even going there and using it. And then all of a sudden I had like a light bulb go off and I just understood how I could use Trello, how I could see it being used. And it's a relatively simple thing. I just, I just couldn't wrap my head around a use case for it for me and for how I wanted to do things. And now I use it for almost every single thing that I do. So I totally mm-hmm. get what mm-hmm. you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. No. And that, that light bulb moment is, is also a lot of fun when you do have something that you didn't yeah. get or you struggled with. And then all of a sudden something clicks, you, you learn mm-hmm. some trick, you change your perspective and all of a sudden, whoop, boy, Hey, this, this actually, I get why somebody else likes it. And maybe I'll hit that point at some point with R. I wouldn't be surprised if I do because I want to like it. But for now, I think that that's the uh, that left-handed scissors is the uh, the best explanation because there's so many people for whom mm-hmm. it's it's really good software and it's a really good programming language and it does exactly what they need in the same way that for a lot of people out there, you know, a tenth to a third of the population, those left-handed scissors <laughs> are a godsend. <laughs> you know? oh. Unfortunately, I'm just not one of them. I mean, I'm left-handed. I would love to just see a pair of left-handed scissors. I don't think I've ever used one. They're hard to find. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Which is a whole nother conversation that might get into things like uh, (laughs) open access and accessibility and so on. But we're not going to go down that road yet. Yeah. We might touch on it because I seem like we always touch on it a little bit. The other side that I had is that I was telling you about the 3D models I made uh, at Ur when uh, when we were there with the drone overflights. And Mm -hmm. I finally gotten all the permissions and yeah. have posted a 3D model beautifully rendered of the Edoublamah structure at Ur and also of the Ziggurat of Ur, nice. both on Sketchfab. And the Ziggurat, I also, because I'm that's the kind of geek I am, I decided to turn into a 3D printable model. So that's on Thingiverse as well. So I'm going to put links oh, to sweet. those. So that our listeners, if they want to go check these out, can. But, you know, I had these just waiting. And because... There are many different stakeholders involved. I didn't want to just post it up there. I wanted to make sure that I had the proper permissions mm-hmm. and I was going to be able to do this without upsetting anybody. And uh, and I finally got the, yeah. the green light and it was all queued up and ready to go. And so that was just a couple hours ago and I'm still riding the high of that. Nice, nice. That's really awesome. And it, and it's, it highlights a, a thing that we should all be aware of when we're doing work in archaeology, which is share it show people. I mean, obviously wait and, 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 you know, suppress that urge to do it right away. Like you did, which was good. Wait until you get the proper, you know, permissions like you did. And, but, but share your work. And a a lot of times, man, we either don't get the opportunity or we don't want to go down the road because it's too hard. And it's, you know, you got to find out from this person and that person, can I do this? But it's so worth it because that's why we do this. So we can, you know, tell stories and, and help other people learn from those. I mean, with the big caveat that you have to make sure that stakeholders and particularly for everybody working in sure. the U.S., a big stakeholder community that has to be considered that often isn't our uh, descendant communities. I don't have that issue mm-hmm. with Iraq, even though I'm sure everybody there is in some way or another descendant community. <laughs> but there, my biggest <laughs> worry was running afoul of the Antiquities Authority, not because they're hard to deal with, but because mm. they might have expectations as to what I can and cannot make public. You know, yeah. not for religious reasons, but for jurisdictional reasons, for permitting reasons. And I wanted to make sure that I was clean with that before sure. I did it. But I'm a huge fan of sharing. And actually, that gets us. That's a nice segue to what I actually wanted to talk about today. So the mm-hmm. project that I worked on in the fall, uh, well, I worked on a number of CRM projects, but I also uh, worked on this project in Iraq, the Lagash Archaeological Project from uh, the University of Pennsylvania. And they are currently writing an NSF grant for the spring and fall seasons next year. And I've been put in charge of coming up with a plan for a full coverage survey of the site. It's a very large site, over 450 hectares. And Mm -hmm. one of the big reasons why I wanted to get into CRM is I have a lot of respect for it because of the scheduling, the deadlines, the fact that you have to take into account legal restrictions and again, descendant communities, other stakeholders, that there are things that cannot be made public. They may be under an NDA or they may be uh, culturally sensitive in certain ways. There are lots of different restrictions on CRM that 
we don't really have an academic archaeology that make mm-hmm. CRM in some ways much more rigorous. And so my hope right. was to be able to start getting my, 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 my feet wet with CRM and bring some of the best ideas across into academic archaeology. And yeah, so th- I've been thinking a lot about how I'm going to do this survey in Lagash next spring based off of some of the things that I've learned in just my few months as a CRM archaeologist. And yeah. one of the main components is going to be then mobile GIS because I do everything with tech. <laughs> you know, I think in tech, mm-hmm. uh, back to how my brain works. And mobile <laughs> GIS is a topic that we've had on this podcast a few times and we each have experiences with. So I'm going to just get the ball rolling here with this now that we've kind of set the, the place, what, laid the table with a uh, mention of uh, touch GIS. Now, you... You reviewed Touch GIS as your app of the day back in episode 131 in June 2020, and we've mm-hmm. mentioned it a couple of times subsequently. Can you, for the for the listeners, can you describe for us how DigTech, how you use Touch GIS in the field? Yeah, and I'll start by saying the reason we were looking for a solution is because I, I don't use Trimbles. The biggest reason around not using a Trimble or or some other you know comparative sub meter device, although. There's very few out there. It's really Trimble is like the one in the, it's the big name in the game there. And the reason we don't do that is because A, we, to be honest, do not do a lot of field work. So I don't need to go spend even a few thousand dollars on a, on a multi-year old, you know, Trimble Mm because who can afford a new one, but I don't need to spend thousands of dollars on an older one. I've rented them before, which is an option. It ends Mm -hmm. up being about $70, $80 a day. And when you need it for, you know, two months, that adds up because they don't care about weekends. You know, you're you're renting it every day that you have Mm -hmm. it. So that gets expensive too. And, you know, I'm just like, there's got to be a different solution. So I started looking around. We typically use iPads or iPhones in the field. So I was looking for an iOS solution and I landed on touch GIS. And, you know, the big, the big problem is usually not just data collection, but data extraction. That's, that's kind of a huge one too. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, and then in the middle of that is, does it support the datums that you need? You know, so can we, can we use the right datum? Can we, enter information in a way that we need to and can we get it out as shape files that we can do you know real stuff with and and send off to other people that are used to seeing shape files as recompatible shape files and that's how touch gs worked for us so mm-hmm. we usually have it on a ipad mini although i have used it on my phone before for stuff i didn't need submeter for and i'm only saying that because we also pair that iPad mini with uh, EOS Aero 100 that we got from Anatom Geomobile Solutions. And mm-hmm. that gives us submeter on the touch GIS interface in the field. And I mean, the, the nice thing about it is we had the, like for this last project that we've been doing the last couple of years, we had the base maps out there that show us exactly where we need to be surveying. And uh, Rachel, my wife, was uh, uh, basically the crew chief out there. And she would, you know, she had a layer where she would mark out exactly what's been surveyed. And, you know, we were you know marking our sites on a different layer. And we mm-hmm. were able to have, you know, feature classes with different uh, symbology and it was just a really great application of it. It's a it's a resource hog for sure. You know, it it definitely pulls the battery down. So we definitely had external batteries that we had out there just to charge them up. But that's that's basically how we use it. Yeah, that's cool. Actually, I didn't really even think of it until you just mentioned it. I didn't put it in our show notes. But that <laughs> ability to have on your device your GIS just actually came in handy a couple of weeks ago on a project. We were looking for a mm-hmm. historical structure and we thought we found it in one area because there's some cinder block and we were all set to do some test trenches by the cinder block. And I was like, well, wait a sec. Let me see if I can do something a little differently here. Let's, let's find out if we're actually in the location of the historical structure. And we had an aerial photograph from 1955, I believe, that had that mm. structure in it, as well as some roads that are still visible. Remnants of them oh. are still visible on the ground. So I took a few GPS points. I found a, a satellite photo in Google Earth that you could see those remnants of the roads. I keyed everything mm-hmm. up, moved that into my GIS, put it on my phone. And when we went back onto the field, we realized that we were a good 30 yards away from where that building was. Mm. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So having the actual reference material right there on hand was, was phenomenally useful for us in that case. 
And we ended up adjusting our project accordingly. We ended up putting our units down in the place where the building actually was rather than where this other building, which wasn't the building that we were looking for, was. Yeah, that's really cool. And and we were able to do a similar thing with the historic topos and dropping them in as a layer and actually, you know, driving along the historic routes and and seeing them mm. on mm-hmm. the map and then be able to turn off that layer with the current topographic maps and, you know, just having all that. And, you know, Touch GIS allowed us to allowed us to do that, which was really handy. Yeah, I am going to say um, before we go to break here that you don't need an external GPS unit no. like what you are using. But if, for example, right. you're using an iPad, mm-hmm. if you have, like I have just an iPad touch, the the basic Wi-Fi model, it doesn't have a GPS receiver. And that bit me in the ass a couple of times this summer. Pardon my <laughs> French. I guess yeah. we have to bleep that. <laughs> <laughs> but if you buy one that has the uh, the cell card, the, that can take a SIM card for cellular, you can buy it outright mm-hmm. without tying it to any particular plan. Wi-Fi plan. And it still has a GPS receiver. And yeah, it's not as yeah. good. It's not the submeter that, that you've got with the EOS Arrow, mm-hmm. but it's better than not having GPS on your device. There yeah. may be ways of pairing it to, to like your phone, which does have GPS, but I'm not, I'm not sure how that would work. Well, and you can. I mean, it pairs through Bluetooth. So you would just use Touch GIS on your phone, right? You would probably just forego the iPad and, and just use it there, which we've done before. That's what I did when I was looking yeah. for this building. I, ju- I just yeah. used my phone. I wasn't going to bring my iPad onto the field on this project. For sure. For sure. I, I think it was really handy for us to have that. And also, as you said, Paul, you may not even need submeter GPS. If you're out doing shovel tests or you're out doing, you know, whatever, submeter is not necessarily required, right? It is required mm-hmm. in the areas we were working in for diagnostic artifacts, datums, you know, site boundaries, stuff like that. We always use submeter yeah. for those things because the agency requires it. So we needed that kind of device. But other people recording other things like non diagnostic artifacts and flakes and stuff like that. You can easily, if you're collecting points on those things, you, not everybody does, but if you're collecting points on those things, you can easily just do it in a, another instance of touch GIS on another device without the submeter information mm-hmm. as long as it doesn't require it. So pretty easy. Yeah. No, that agency required, that's one of the kind of underlining points that I think is very interesting about CRM versus academic archaeology is that so much mm-hmm. of what's done in CRM is agency required by the SHPO, yeah. by the TIPO, by whatever state you're working in, you've got to do X, Y, and Z. Yeah. And that often doesn't exist exist in academic archaeology with the end result that people in academic archaeology are often reinventing the wheel, Mm -hmm. whereas people in CRM don't even have the option because it has to be done (laughs) to certain specs. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, with that, let's take a break. And when we come back, you can tell us about your experience using Collector on a project after you worked with us. Back in a minute. Chris Webster here for the Archaeology Podcast Network. We strive for high quality interviews and content so you can find information on any topic in archaeology from around the world. One way we do that is by recording interviews with our hosts and guests located in many parts of the world all at once. We do that through the use of Zencaster. That's Z E N C A S T R. Zencaster allows us to record high quality audio with no stress on the guest. Just send them a link to click on, and that's it. Zencaster does the rest. They even do automatic transcriptions. Check out the link in the show notes for 30% off your first three months or go to zencastr.com and use the code Archaeotech. That's A-R-C-H-A-E-O-T-E-C-H. Looking to expand your knowledge of x-rays and imaging in the archaeology field? Then check out An Introduction to Paleo Radiography, a short online course offering professional training for archaeologists and affiliated disciplines. Created by archaeologist, radiographer, and lecturer James Elliott, the content of this course is based upon his research and teaching experience in higher education. It is approved by the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists as four hours of training. That's in the UK, for those of you that don't know. So don't miss out on this exciting opportunity for professional and personal development. For more information on pricing and course structure, visit paleoimaging.com. That's P-A-L-E-O imaging.com. And look for the link in the show notes to this episode. 
America. We are endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. By honoring your sacred vocation of education, you impact your family, your friends, and your community. At Grand Canyon University, our online bachelor's, master's, and doctoral education degree programs allow you to balance online coursework with observational and hands-on experience in the field. Find your purpose at GCU. Private. Christian. Affordable. Visit gcu.edu. Welcome back to the Archaeotech Podcast, episode 170. And, you know, we're definitely in the winter season as my wife hands me my Theraflu, my, my drink of choice right now in the evening. <laughs> it's delicious. I hope, I hope, Paul, you've got something better than I do right now. <laughs> um, a Voodoo Ranger Imperial IPA. Yeah, it's better. <laughs> ah, very good. Very good. Nice, nice. So, as I mentioned before we went to the break, you know, after you left the project you were working on with us over the summer, where we're using mm-hmm. Touch GIS, you did some other CRM projects and you did the Lagash project. And I mentioned you using Collector. So tell us about that. The, the reason I'm really interested in this is because Collector is probably one of the most well-known tablet-based applications or phone-based applications that people use. And I've honestly only ever used it like once or twice. Most of the time it's been either Trimble's or something else I've used on a, on a tablet. So I, I, I have shockingly little experience with Collector. Yeah. So I don't have experience with setting things up in Collector, but I do have some experience now using it. Now, I'm, I'm actually going to back up a little bit here because I first encountered Touch GIS. You know, you'd mentioned it. I'd looked at it. I had no purpose for it. So I didn't have like a data set that I could use, except for when I was working with you in Nevada. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, Touch GIS. And I was like, this is what I've been waiting for. You know, I stopped doing field work prior to prior to uh, quitting my IT job uh, in 2021. The last time I was in the field was in 2004, and I yeah. always knew what I wanted to see in the field. And I, you know, I've been keeping current in the literature, so I knew that people were using things like this. But just like there's a difference between reading about a site and seeing it for your with your own eyes, seeing it for yourself, mm-hmm. there's a difference about reading that people are using mobile GIS and using it myself in the field. And so I saw what you had done. I saw that there was a certain amount of pre-planning in order to upload different layers of different kinds of data into the touch GIS on the tablet that was going into the field. But then once it was there, it was really straightforward for me and, and it made a lot of yeah. sense. And then- Another project, not really at liberty to talk about it much other than we used ArcGIS Collector on that project. Mm -hmm. And it was very, very similar. So it took me absolutely no time to figure out, you know, I mean, fortunately, the field director showed me how to use it, but it took me no time to to totally grok it. It just, it made sense. It was easy. And so now I have these two different mobile GISs that I'm trying to compare for part of this, for this Lagash project, for the survey that I'm going to do on the Lagash project. Mm-hmm. And I can't use GIS Collector at the moment because you have to have a license. And so we're trying to figure out the project does have a license and Pennsylvania, University of Pennsylvania does have a license, but we have to make sure that all the pieces are in play. So yeah. I put together in touch GIS, which you can use in a limited capacity for free, I put together a prototype of how I would do the layering, the mapping, and so on. And then I'm going to try to reproduce the same thing in Collector and compare the two, you know, side by side, see which one makes more sense to me as a person who's going to be managing a project and doing, you know, the bulk of the actual data collection. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Quick note on Touch JS and the cost there. First off, I love how you can use it for free and... Mm. I mean, really, the only reason we needed to pay for it is because of the exports. You don't get shapefile exports unless you pay for it. So realistically, you could probably set up your whole project and collect a bunch of data. There might be some restrictions. I'm not really sure because we kind of paid for it right away because I knew we'd need it. There might be some restrictions on how much you can record. Like, I don't know if there's project limitations or shapefile limitations or something like that, but or layers or anything. But either way, we needed the exports. But it was like... I think it was uh, $29.99 a month or something like that. So, you know, for this whole $150,000 project that we did, I paid for it for like three months until we got our data out of it and then shut it off. So 90 bucks, you can't really go wrong (laughs) compared to an Esri license. Yeah. So our project, we're writing this grant. So 
And like I said, the school and the project already have some license to Esri products. The, the problem that I have with Esri products isn't the products themselves. It's the licensing I, is Byzantine to me. There are too many different subcomponents and whatnot, uh, which is something that used to just make my blood boil when I was uh, you know, a systems administrator and had to install server software on you know, Windows servers. Is it, more effort seemed to have been put into licensing models than making sure the software worked. And <laughs> that's not to say that the Esri products don't work because I know they do work. But but wow, the licensing is is totally obscure to me. But because of that licensing, I can't test it. Whereas with Touch GIS, I can test it on the free mode. And you're right, you can't export the shape files. So that leaves a big question for me that I might mention a little later. And I think there's mm-hmm. a limit on the number of projects you can have. But for this project, I only need one project, so I'm within that limit. So I, I can really kick its tires well. Now, the problem that I potentially have with Touch GIS is that it hasn't been updated now in over a year. And so part of me is worried that it's abandonware. I don't know if that's mm. the case. I haven't been in touch with the company, which I need to do before I make any decision. But th- that's a little unnerving to me that uh, wow. it hasn't been updated so long. Then the other... On the other hand, ArcGIS, which I haven't been able to test, ArcGIS Collector is reviled by a lot of archaeologists. I had no troubles when I used it on the project, and I think that is a testament to their GIS department having pre, you know, thought through and preloaded the data that was necessary, the layers that are necessary, mm-hmm. onto the, the iPads that we were using. I don't know how tough it is to set things up, but um, but I suspect that a lot of the complaints people have had about using ArcGIS Collector in the field is because it hasn't been set up properly. I'm not worried about that because I'm going to be the one setting it up and I'm going to make damn sure that I set it up the way I want it. However, and here's the other <laughs> gotcha, is that a Collector has now been sunlighted. Sunlighted? That's not the right word. It's been deprecated in uh, in favor of ArcGIS field maps. And looking at the Apple Store for field maps, there seems to have some stability issues, especially when it's being used offline, which is going to be the case for the iPads that we're going to have in the field at Lagash. So I do have some, you know, in terms of basic usability, I think that they're going to be very comparable, but... <laughs> Mm-hmm. which is going to be the better long-term solution because if the the method that I'm putting together for the survey works, it's extensible. It can be expanded and it can be made more intensive very easily. And so mm-hmm. I want to uh, to have something that we can you know rely upon for the next you know let's say three years of field work. Yeah, yeah, that would be that would be ideal, right? Of course. Yeah. The thing that I think any solution needs to be capable of is the ability to, as we've talked about in the past with other data solutions, is the ability to get the data out in a way that is not proprietary, right? And Mm -hmm. that's one of the reasons why I think... You know, it's interesting to me that Touch GIS doesn't look like it's been updated in over a year. You know, I I look at their website and everything looks fine over there and and the software still works and everything looks good. And I'm like, I'm kind of thinking like, well, if it's the best solution for right now and and let's say you even used it at this project in the spring, the worst case scenario is, yeah, they abandon the software, you update your tablet and you can no longer use the application because they didn't update the application. But you can still get shape files out of it, and mm-hmm. you can move on to something else and bring those bring those shape files into the into the something else. It would be nice to use the same piece of software for you know in perpetuity, uh, but I don't know. The nice thing is you can get the data out and you can get data back in super easily. So, right, yeah, and and I agree with you. I, I'm th- th- I'm talking about the best case scenario. And yeah. I certainly know that field work rarely <laughs> meets the best case scenario, <laughs> that you always have to be adaptive. And you're right, that having file formats, files that you can export in formats that can be read in other software is key. Mm. Uh, we've talked about yeah. that plenty of times with many different things. And yeah, so if I can export shape files or KMLs or something like that out of my mobile GIS solution, I can use it in... Mm-hmm. You know, in ArcGIS, I can use it in QGIS. I can, you know, do whatever I want with it. KML files, I could import them directly into Google Earth if I wanted to. You know, so just as long as I have that ability to get my data back out, I'll be okay because I'm going to have over 1,700 individual data collection points. (laughs) Yeah. And if I have to transcribe all that by hand, uh, I'll be very upset. Yeah. Yeah. That would be crazy. 
So let me pivot a little bit here and explain for you and for our listeners. And I'm really actually, I'm soliciting input from our listeners because I know that we have a lot of very techy, very skilled people that, that listen to the podcast. And if anybody hears something that they're, you know, raises a red flag or they hear some, something that, that triggers an idea, some way to improve upon what I'm saying, you know, uh, unfortunately, by the time you get this podcast, the NSF grant is going to be turned in, but you know, we can always <laughs> adjust. Uh, no, seriously. Yeah. I mean, it's not going to, I think that I've got a solid foundation, but there mm-hmm. may be ways of, of improving upon that. Right. Yeah. So, the way that we use Collector on that CRM project, it was, a, it was a, an STP project. And basically, we had a, a couple different uh, fields. And the GIS department pre-plotted one layer in Collector of the targets, right? Go to mm-hmm. this point, go to that point, go to the other point. Me, as the digger, I'd take my my pad, my iPad, I'd plant myself more or less on the point in question, the STP, yeah. and I would dig the hole. And then afterwards, I would add a new layer, one of two kinds, well, one of three kinds, either a positive to say that we found artifacts, a negative yeah. to say that I dug the hole and there was nothing there, or a write-off because we had a lot of slope and uh, and water write-offs. Okay. But once I, I visited the point, I would do the work there. There were fields already on the layer for both positive and negatives to describe the, the different soil layers, as well as with positives to describe what was found archaeologically, what kind of artifacts were there, and then move on. And then I there would now be two points for each point. The pre-plot, the ideal location of each, of each target unit test, and then the what I actually did there, what I, and what I actually did there included what I found there or did not find there. Okay, and so that was all brought back together. And the next day we'd go out in the field, and this would all be updated. So even though I did my transects over here, and my uh, my colleague did another set of transects over there, I would now see his transects and mine. It all be updated nightly, which was a great system. This to me felt like really just a smart way of doing it because I didn't have to pull out my compass and pace, you know, (laughs) pace out however many meters and then not know exactly and be able to, you know, and just say, you know, hold my hand up and say, oh yeah, I got it in this spot. (laughs) I could show, I could demonstrate. It was recorded for me very simply, very quickly that I actually got to the place. Now, this isn't to say that you shouldn't be able to use a compass. This isn't saying that you shouldn't be able to pace out an even meter, but it made it so much simpler because what we were doing was extremely repetitive work. And for that extremely repetitive work, it doesn't matter that you, you know, that you're a grade A surveyor. What matters mm-hmm. is that you can get your butt over a point on a map, dig a hole, and then describe what you found there. And so, back yeah. to that notion of taking CRM and moving it into academic archaeology, this is the basic methodology that I want to use on Lagash. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and when it comes down to, I mean, even just shovel testing, right, and, and getting that survey methodology down that is such a good way to do it is to pre-plot out all that stuff and even if you're even if you're walking transects or you're doing you know something else that requires certain distance apart or distance measuring in some way or another we're always doing something that requires you know some sort of distance measuring it's just best if you can plan that out ahead of time and people you know everybody has their own device where they can they can follow along and and stay on track even if only one person if you're in a line has it you know then at least somebody is on their line cuz I'll tell you what man I did shovel testing back in the southeast in fact where I'm at now in north and south carolina was some of the first places I had worked in CRM and you were lucky if if, you know, there was a Trimble out there, it was usually just like mm-hmm. some other GPS or maybe it was a Trimble. Nobody individually had one. The crew chief had one and, and they would come over and, and shoot in positives if you found them. So you'd have to flag all your positives and they would shoot those in. But the negative ones and, and as you're just doing your transects, they basically line you up on the road and say, OK, you're going this way at a bearing of, you know, whatever degrees. And uh, and you just compass it compass and pace it out and i'll tell you what that is not super accurate everybody thinks they have a good pace and then you're you're crashing through the forest and you you may or may not stay on your line because you're like which tree was i looking at when i sighted this in and it's just oh my god it is so fraught with error and you know could be argued that you don't need to be like super accurate with those when you're doing shovel testing but that being said if you've got a nice point to go to and it's easy and everybody has that information then it's great i love it 
Yeah. And, you know, even if you're not doing that kind of work where you have a, a grid or an interval that you've got to, to, to stick to, having the mobile GIS <laughs> that you've looked at and the whoever's planning the, the day's work knows, you know, the area that should be covered in acres mm -hmm. or hectares or whatever you're doing and has an estimate of how long that'll take, that informs so much of the project and takes away a lot of the guesswork. And yeah. oh, that, that, that guesswork... I don't like because it, it built up my stress level. It built up my stress mm. level in the same way that Munsell's built, built up my stress <laughs> level because I can never find a match for a Munsell chip that matches what I'm looking at. Yeah. That's a, that's a whole nother rant of mine, but, <laughs> but, but, you know, getting rid of ambiguity as much as possible for the people who are working in the field, I think is a net positive for everybody that's trying to do their work. Even if it means that the work itself is just a little stupider, mm -hmm. it's really not because it can be that much higher quality by getting rid of some of those vagaries of, you know, field work just because we've always done it this way in the past. Yeah, indeed. All right. Well, that sounds like a good point to take a break. So let's do that and come back and wrap up this discussion on mobile GIS in segment three. Back in a minute. You may have heard my pitch for membership. It's a great idea and really helps out. However, you can also support us by picking up a fun t-shirt, sticker, or something from a large selection of items from our T Public store. Head over to arcpodnet.com slash shop for a link. That's arcpodnet.com slash shop to pick up some fun swag and support the show. Welcome back to episode 170 of the Archaeotech podcast, and we're talking mobile GIS solutions. And Paul, we're going to wrap up this segment now. So where do we go from here? Okay, this is not going to be the best podcast interface. Maybe a YouTube channel would be better for this, but I'm going to describe a little bit about what I'm doing because I think that I can describe it. Mm -hmm. And I just want to hear from you and hopefully from some of the listeners if this makes sense. So basically what I've done is I've set up a bunch of nodes, just like we had on that uh, that CRM project, across mm -hmm. the site of Ur, of not Ur. <laughs> That's a whole <laughs> different dream. Uh, across the site of Lagash <laughs> in order to do yeah. surface collection. And so what I did is in QGIS, I downloaded the Quick Map Services plugin and I pulled in actually the bing map was the prettiest mm -hmm. and then from that i traced the site outline onto a new layer using the polygon trace tool and then i used the create grid tool using that polygon to create a regular grid and i did that at different resolutions so i did that a 10 meter grid 20 meter grid a 40 meter grid and a 50 meter grid or maybe mm. 25 20 25 and 50 i can't remember it doesn't really matter and then after that i used the intersection tool to basically use the the site outline as a cookie cutter to get mm. rid of all of those grid points that lay outside of the site so mm. what i ended up with was a grid of nodes across the site itself and from each of those i could get a, a discrete count you know if i did a 10 meter grid this is how many nodes there'd be on the site. If I did it at a 50 meter grid, there'd be 1,783 uh, nodes. <laughs> and I know that because that's what we finally decided on. And then on top of that, what I decided I was going to do for the data collection is that we're going to go in the same way that I did with those STPs. You're going to take the iPad. You're going to go to the next point on whatever your transect is, plant a stake there. Mm -hmm. The ground is soft enough that you can just drive it in with your hands with then a cord tied to the stake uh, and then do a sweep. So you get a circle and within that, collect mm -hmm. everything that you find on the surface in that circle. Okay. So I did that again, modeled it at, uh, at various lengths. So a one meter cord, which would then give you a two meter diameter circle to five and 10 or something. I can't remember mm -hmm. exactly. Again, doesn't really matter because at this point, it's all just still math. So from that, I could tell how much of the surface area of the site would be covered with each combination of the fineness of the grid and the diameter of, of the circle that okay. you collect at each one. My idea of doing just full collections is there's lots of pottery and a fair amount of slag, a number of stone tools, a lot of shell. And those are the four main kinds of, of artifact types that we find mm -hmm. all across the site. So anybody that's been mm -hmm. on a Mesopotamian site knows that that's how they are. You walk across and you're stepping on pot shirts. So that would be something that you could do really quickly, collect everything that you see in that circle, 
that takes the individual out of it, right? right? If I wanted to collect, say, just diagnostic pot sherds, I could certainly do that. But that means that I, as the data collector, have to be aware of what the diagnostics might be and have to take a lot more time actually picking them up. So right. anyhow, I made, a, uh, I made uh, an assumption of how long it would take to get from one point to the next point, set up your stake, and do the sweep for each of the different radii of, uh, of collection. And from then, mm-hmm. I mean, that's the, that's the big guess is, you know, am I right with this? And from then I could, I could divide it up into how long it would take and divide that and come up with a figure of how many person hours it would take. Uh, and then in looking at all this, what we decided was that a 50 meter grid with a two meter cord, so a four meter diameter catchment at each point, mm-hmm. collecting everything uh, would get us 0.5% of the entire site in roughly 40 to 45 person days. Wow. And that seemed like it was the right balance. Yeah. The big, the if, if, if I'm right with my estimate of how long it's going to take, the big challenges then are we have to have an iPad for each person. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so that's roughly a thousand dollars, not for the iPad, but for the iPad and the software. Yeah. And, we're probably going to want an extra one, depending on how many people we'd send out there, maybe even two extras just in case something gets dropped and broken. Yep. And how long it takes to post-process the, the fines. But if we're doing a full coverage and collecting everything in those uh, the circles, what we can end up with is we can divide it, you know, in the laboratory, we can divide it up by type, we can divide it, you know, or by material, by chronology for things that we can date fairly tightly, like, uh, like mm-hmm. pot shirts again. And then we can take those all back into the GIS and do heat plots. Nice. So, you know, so this is basically, this is taking what we were doing on the CRM project and adapting it for the surface survey. And I think that it'll really work. If somebody has, you know, again, if they've got some red flags about why this wouldn't work, I would love to hear them at this point before I actually go out in the field and try to do it. But I think that this is doable. Then in order to control the uh, the points, once we discuss this, we decided that we're doing this 50 meter grid. We discuss strategy. They want to start working in the spring in the south of the site mm-hmm. and they don't want to bump into us. They're also curious about finding out an area that was found in 1984 by a previous surveyor in the north of the site that they haven't relocated. But there was an extra density of, I believe, slag in that area. So they asked that I start at the north of the site. So what I did is I downloaded out of QGIS a spreadsheet of all those point coordinates. And I then just did a simple little formula that gives a name to each one. So each east-west transect starts at, it's an irregularly shaped site, but the the top, the north one would be, the north transect would be transect one. And the first point in that would be point one. So one dash one. Mm. And the next one down, next one south would be one dash whatever, if you go straight south, but the first one on the next transect south would be two dot one, right? Okay. Two dot one, three dot one, four dot one, but they're not going to line up vertically, but that way we can always know. And then what you do is you do your collection, you grab everything that you find on the surface there, put in a bag, call the bag, you know, collection from, you know, transect 27.08. And there you've got 27.08. We can plot that exactly back on the thing. We've recorded in another layer where we actually did the uh, the collection. If we have a negative, you get someplace. And for whatever reason, there's, there are no surface finds. We record that in the same way that if we did that STP and there was nothing in it, it was a negative. Another layer, maybe for notes, you know, I'm walking from one point to the next and I see architecture visible under the surface because sometimes it is visible depending on the, the moisture of the the, uh, the environment at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, drop a point right there so that it doesn't pollute my other stuff and also have a point, a layer type for, um, for write-offs, right? Okay. The pre-plot accidentally put you in somebody's backyard. <laughs> Let's not do that. The pre-plot accidentally put me in the canal. I'm not going to go there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and that renamed spreadsheet then, I imported back into QGIS 
exported as a KML and imported that into Touch GIS, which sounds like a nice. lot of steps, but in my mind, they make a lot of sense. It was it was very boom, 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 boom from one to one. And using tools that I already know, uh, using a process that I do and I could explain to my colleagues and they said, yeah, that kind of makes sense. But again, from you and from anybody else, I'd like to hear why it might not work or if there's a way of improving upon that. Yeah. I mean, this is really interesting approach and it, it really comes down to why people choose the survey intervals and data collection methods that they do, right? With me not knowing a whole lot about the Lagash site, I'm really curious about, I'm personally curious about what is on the surface. You know what I mean? Is this stuff mm-hmm. that is contemporaneous with the time period that Lagash was inhabited? Or is yeah. this stuff that was much later? And you're just trying to get this off the surface so you can start digging in some places and sign it? Or or is this really like an erosional surface expression of the thing you're actually looking for? Yeah, no, that's actually a great point. And that's one of the reasons why Lagash is really, really a useful test site for this because even though it's a humongous site and in the late mm-hmm. early dynastic of uh, Mesopotamia, so roughly around 2300 BCE, it was the largest site in the area and probably the most powerful as well. Yeah, but it wasn't occupied for very long. So most of the most of the sites there have a fair amount of accumulation and they're you know they stick up visibly over the surrounding plain. Lagash doesn't really a whole lot. There are a couple spots on the site that are taller, but for the most part, it's a very flat, low site. And previous surveys that have been done there show that the majority of the material all dates to that same time period when this was the preeminent site in Mm. Mesopotamia. So because of that, most of what we're going to find is going to be roughly contemporaneous. Okay. Now, I said, you know, we could look at chronology with potsherds because that's, the, you know, we can't look at chronology with with, uh, with slag. We're not going to mm-hmm. be able to look at chronology with shell. With stone, if they're carved into distinctive vessels or statuary, we could look at chronology. But if it's just a piece of something that's hard to tell what it might have been from, we're not going to tell chronology. Potsherds, we probably can. But, but for the most part, what we're looking for is looking for use areas. We're looking for those areas of the site that have higher concentrations of slag in particular, but also shell, pottery, especially, say, if we find a lot of pot, pot wasters, mm-hmm. you know, kiln wasters, that, that might tell us that, hey, the kilns were in this part of the site. Mm. Gotcha. Right? And so we can plot all these things against each other, then use that for further seasons of exploration. And we also have other plans for thermal photography, drone photography. I'm actually working on a separate part of the uh, the grant for that. And other things like great uh, magnetic gradiometry and mm-hmm. resistivity and so on. So these are all going to inform each other. But I think that this as the surface collection should work. And I think that, you know, with, if I got my estimates right, we can do it within a year. It takes the individual very much out of it. And I'm not trying to take the individual out of it because I am going to be doing the work myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We have at least yeah. one surveyor and that's me, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, so it's not, it's not a matter of being uh, punitive towards the, the individuals. It's to take the variability between person A and person B out of it, which opens up options for us. You know, if somebody can't make it out in the field one day or they finish up whatever they're working on early, we can quickly show them how to use the iPad and get them out in the field. If we have yeah. students to come down from Baghdad, for example, it'd be wonderful to take some archaeology students, some Iraqis, you know, and show them and have them work side by side with us. That would be a, a real positive outcome of this. And I think that it's a system that's simple enough that we could we could do that. Yeah. So I'm I'm really, you know, if you haven't heard in my voice, I'm really excited about the prospect of this working. <laughs> and that's maybe just uh, the problem. I'm a little too excited. <laughs> I'm worried that there's some, that I've got a real big blind spot on something that, uh, that I'm not considering here. Well, the, the only thing that jumps out at me as a project manager is time. It's always about yeah. time, especially with a project where you've got to fly in, you have a, a return plane ticket. It's not like CRM where uh, maybe we can just go back out next week, right? And we can dismiss the yeah. rest of the crew and we can clean up some stuff. Like that's literally not a possibility. So, the only thing I'm thinking of is is your estimate on how long it's going to take somebody to do this, you know, four meter diameter circle and and collect all the stuff because you, you have a lot of factors at play, right? Like how much stuff is in that circle? How quickly is somebody at collecting when you're dealing with CRM? 
yeah, you can probably convince uh, field techs to just start dumping a bunch of stuff in a bag and worry about it later, right? Just write a label on the outside. When mm-hmm. you're dealing with academics, possibly students, they're going to sit and examine every single piece and go, look how cool this is and call somebody over. And, and, and they're just going to, they're going to dwell on it rather than drop it in a bag and catalog it later. You know what I mean? They don't have that CRM yeah. mentality necessarily. And so there's that. And then there's also, you know, anytime I think we're going to get this much done, I, I drop 20% for people being sick and weather. So, yeah, you know, I mean, <laughs> and that's know. all fair. That's, that's all absolutely fair. And that's, that's where I recognize is the big unknown is, you know, did my estimate yeah. of how long it's going to take? Is that the correct thing? Cause everything up to that estimate is just math. Yeah. There's no yeah. changing it. The math that goes into that estimate is an estimate. It's a guess on my part how long it's going to sure. take. And there's going to be some variability there from one person to the next, from one part of the site to the next, dependent on weather, uh, people's health, mm-hmm. you know, all of the above. But if it turns out that I was off, and mind yeah. you, I used to always assume that uh, I, I'd, I'd budget out the time for a particular project in IT, and then I'd double that. And mm-hmm. then that's what I would tell my boss. That's how long it's going to take. <laughs> yeah. Right. I learned that from Star Trek as a, <laughs> from Scotty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I always use that because not because then it makes me look great when I've done it or under the deadline, but because more often than nine, I'm bumping up against that double the amount of time it, I expected deadline. Yeah. Yeah, right? for sure. So we're going to see. But yeah. if it turns out that I'm wrong, the math is easy enough to do. Say, oh, geez, everything took three times longer than I thought. It's not going to take 40 days. It's going to take 120 days. Well, now we know how many people we have to throw at the project. Yeah. And yeah. it's a little different than what you were saying about the field work in that they don't expect the whole thing to be done in the first season. I yep. have high hopes of being done in, in one season. Mm-hmm. But they're like, well, no, if you don't get done in the first season and we have to push this into the fall, it's fine because you've already hit the part of the site that we care about most. Yeah. Nice. So, yeah. This is project management. Right. And it's not like they're putting a Walmart up there over the summer. So No, that's true. You know, yeah. So you, you really have, I mean, unless the rack plans to do something with that land and, and it really is kind of nope. a press on this, then... I mean, you really have an unlimited amount of time, to be honest. I mean, you have to get your time estimates somewhat accurate just for your funding sources, right? So you're not, you know, you're not way off on that and, and you're managing those expectations. But otherwise, it's kind of a good position to be in. So I yeah. like it. Um, hey, just in the last minute here, and this probably isn't enough time to even talk about this, but one other thing I was curious about is your 50 meter interval. And mm-hmm. one of the reasons we choose intervals where we're working in CRM is based on the likelihood of site sizes that we're going to find. We, we hope that our interval crosses over a a section of something that could be a site, right? I mean, we record isolates when we find them, but we Mm -hmm. really don't necessarily care about isolates for that. For the most part, we're looking for sites and we're hoping to cross paths with those. So what do you think you would miss on a 50 meter interval? You know what I mean? That's something you have to think about. Yeah. So what I would miss on a 50 meter interval is variability within neighborhoods. What I'm hoping Mm. to find uh, at this interval is different sectors of the site, because the whole thing is a site, uh, different sectors of the site that are devoted more to certain types of behaviors than other types. You know, this is where it looks like there's a lot of shell for some reason. Let's figure it out. Maybe they were processing shell here. Here's a lot of slag. Well, they're probably uh, we're smelting here. Here's a lot of kiln wasters. They probably were uh, were doing pottery here, but we don't care about the, the 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 fine detail of you know one building to the next, which we would definitely not get with this. Yeah. But that's the other thing about this, and I've already sold the the team on this is that the same methodology can be done at a higher density. It can be done at a higher density in two ways: tighter grid and or bigger catchment. And so once we've identified an area that we want to investigate a little more carefully prior to excavation, if we Mm -hmm. ever do intend to excavate, we could do the same thing on a 10 meter grid with a 10 meter catchment and get almost 100%. Nice. Nice. Well, there you go. All right. Well, this sounds really cool and looking forward to hearing the results and, and how this all works out. Should you guys, hopefully you guys get the funding and you get to go out there in the spring. So That'd be fingers crossed. That'd be really awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, Paul. And thanks everybody for listening and check out our information in the show notes. You can hit up Paul on Twitter or through his email address. Both of those are in the show notes. Just look down at your phone. They're sitting right there since you're probably listening to this on your mobile device and Mm -hmm. let him know what you think about his survey methodology and how he can improve it. (laughs) Yeah, please do. 
<laughs> yeah, indeed. All right. Well, thanks, Paul. Thanks, everybody. Uh, we hope you had a good 2021 since this is our first release in 2022. Hopefully the new year went off without a hitch for you. And we hope everybody has a, like I said, a good and prosperous 2022. So we will see you next time. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Architect Podcast. Links to items mentioned on the show are in the show notes at www.archpodnet.com slash Archaeotech. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com and paul at lugal.com. Support the show by becoming a member at archpodnet.com slash members. The music is a song called Off Road and is licensed free from Apple. Thanks for listening. This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV traveling the United States, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, DigTech LLC, Cultural Media, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Rachel Roden. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Thanks again for listening to this episode and for supporting the Archaeology Podcast Network. If you want these shows to keep going, consider becoming a member for just $7.99 US dollars a month. That's cheaper than a venti quad eggnog latte. Go to archpodnet.com slash members for more info. At Grand Canyon University, we believe in equal opportunity, and the American dream starts with purpose. Whether your pursuit involves a bachelor's, master's, or doctoral degree, GCU's learning environments are designed for supportive networking and collaboration. With over 330 academic programs, GCU provides a path to help you fulfill your dreams. The pursuit to serve others is yours. Find your purpose at GCU. Private. Christian. Affordable. Visit gcu.edu. Introducing Zaxby's new chicken finger tacos. One with pico and creamy chipotle ranch, and the other with bacon and avocado ranch. Chicken experts since 1990. Taco experts since now. Woo, saucy. Zaxby's. Oh.